Hello, and welcome to this, another episode of Frame and Reference. I'm your host, Kenny McMillan, and you're listening to episode 140 with Veronica Bowser, DP of The Gutter. Enjoy. Have you been watching anything cool recently, or have you just been working like crazy? Um, it's, it's kind of a mix of both. I've been actually interviewing a lot, so I feel like I've been doing like a lot of reading. And then I've been like looking up projects that are kind of related to that project. So I feel like I haven't watched anything like for fun, but I'm seeing Monkey Man tonight. So I'm really excited. That looks cool. Because that looks amazing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's it's funny. It's always that balance, like as a DP of like, what do you watch when you get home? Like half the time, I just want to say Seinfeld. But then other times it's like a very like work centric meeting. And you're like, ah, oh, Okay. I'm watching Shogun, which I do love. And then I'm more like kind of breaking that down. So yeah. that, that balance. It's it's funny. I uh, I feel like all DPs should say like, oh yeah, I just have Criterion Channel going 24-7. It's like, no, I got home and watched Friends for two hours. Or I guess that's only... Well, well no, that is just like you're, you're, you're tired. Like you've been thinking so much all day and like everyone else that you kind of want to shut off your brain. And then... Of course, that part of you is always like over analyzing things. So it's nice to watch friends. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's a guarantee. Like, I'm going to laugh. I have a hard time getting into uh, shows that have like 40 seasons. Yeah. I, you know what? It's super funny now that you're saying it. I went on like a binge that was taking shows that have lived, like 40 seasons and I just watched the first season or I, I just watched that like, pivotal season and then I'm done and people will always ask like Cheers for example like I only watched the first season and people will ask me questions about like the rest of the show I'm like I can't that's too dangerous I'm not opening up that can of worms I've already saw the first season I'm done yeah. for me uh, that's funny I uh, for some reason I don't know if this is true with all shows and if it is, it pisses me off that Netflix always cancels it after the third season. But like Star Trek is the one that I remember. Like the third season of every Star Trek is where they really hit their stride and it gets like super interesting. The first two, they're always trying to find it. So whatever yeah. you're like, should I get it? I'm like, yeah, you should watch TNG or D Space Nine and just jump to the third. You maybe watch the first two episodes to know who's who and then just straight to the third season. <laughs> well, I mean, I feel like we're we're in that age where you could just go online and i feel like with every show i watch i tend to just go on youtube and like do the recap video to like yeah. oh what were the secret hidden things in that episode i'm like wow why can't i just like watch an episode no i have to like watch the the aftermath of the episode and like really dive in story-wise and figure out what was happening it is like even what was it the one i was just watching um three body problem like I loved that, and then and then I go online, and there's all the people who have read the books and stuff, and I'm just like, God, like I am a little upset that we can't, like especially for a show, let's put all, yeah. let's put it all in there, like at least the stuff that matters. Like I don't need to. It's so annoying to have to go on Reddit and have some twenty year old describe to me like all the important stuff that I should have had context for, and I'm like, is this like the I'm Marvelification cool. of it all? You know, like the Marvel TV shows come out, and they're like, oh, you had to see all those to get what's going on in Endgame two or whatever, and I'm like. You're like, well, I have, I have no chance. I have yeah. No chance. I, I literally just put on that book, so I'm ready to do them. Yeah. There's a lot, man, uh, speaking of like Android and Apple, Apple TV, all like, I don't know what is in the water over there, but they just seem to be hitting nonstop, like good production values, but also just like great shows that they don't even advertise. Like Criminal Record. I just interviewed the DP from Criminal Record, which I literally was just watching and I go, I love Peter Cabaldi, but I was like, yeah, this is great. And then I just DM'd the DV. I'm like, you want to talk to me about it? He goes, yeah, okay. Like, but I never saw an ad for it. Like, it's a sick show. It's it's funny. I yeah, I don't really see ads for Apple TV. Like, I have to make an effort to go on Apple TV. But then when I do, I have a great time. Yeah. But it doesn't have as much like attraction or like you see all the advertisement for a show. So it's it's interesting. How we're like forced into looking at certain things and you're like, oh yeah, what about that over there? Well, it's like, I kind of wish like this, I'm just picking this because there's a billboard by my house, but like damsel, right? You've got, uh, what's her name? I think I know, I I think I know where this billboard is. 
Yeah, oh, really? I, I, I have this billboard. It's like a hot sun. Oh, no, I'm on the west side. So they, like they've got a couple of them. But, um, oh, yeah. okay. but uh, it's like, I wish they would spend more time advertising the stuff that isn't. You just say like, hey, this is like shot by these cool people that you already know with someone you already know in it. Like that could just be a, a Instagram ad. Like put the shows that no one knows about on the billboards so they get a better shot. So we're not canceling stuff like no one saw. It's like no one knew about it. Oh, yeah. No, it's. Yeah. No, it's 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 super tough because I feel like sometimes, especially when you're working in the industry, like you're in your own bubble. of You feel like things are super popular. But then you kind of leave that and you're like, no one knows this show. No one knows this movie. I just hang out with the same 10 people who keep talking about the same project. Or they're like, they're all working on that project. I'm like, oh, I'll work on this project. It is the, that is the one nice thing about living in LA is like, even if they're not industry folks, they, you can all kind of talk. Not that it's fun to nonstop talk about work, but like, it's still enjoy, you know, I got into the gig because I like the medium. I like the art form. And so it's nice yeah. that I can talk to like other people, like uh, me and my uh, girlfriend were at my buddy's wedding in uh, Whitefish, Montana a couple years ago. And there was, it was like the summer. So there was no one there. So there was just mm -hmm. one outdoor bar that was open that basically everyone in town went to, which was like 40 people. And it was just funny talking to them about like stuff that I had seen or whatever. They're like, we got King of the Hill. And you're like, that's great. I love that for you. Yeah. <laughs> Gee, have you gone to a theater? They're like, nah, I don't do that. Oh, of course. No, it's, it's, that's why I always love like shooting in different locations. Cause I feel like you just get immersed into that location or like I did a movie last year in New Jersey and we were in Montclair. It was like pretty small town, but there was like only one theater, like the closest other like big AMC was like pretty far away, but it was fun just going to that mom and pop theater, like yeah. kind of uncomfortable, like seating lines, but it was a great experience. I, I grew up in uh, Napa Valley, and uh, yeah. but I wasn't in Napa proper. I was in this town called St. Helena. There's only 5,000 people. They're tiny. And uh, we had one theater in Napa and one in Santa Rosa. And the Napa one was just like, it was like an eight screen, just not great, but it, not terrible. But uh, yeah. I went back and visited a couple of years ago, and they now have this like uh, Cinemark XD like they like bulldozed yes. a whole part of town just to put this massive theater in. And it's so funny because all of Napa is just like vineyards and buildings from like the early 1900s. And then this giant white box <laughs> off the freeway. You're like, oh my God. Well, I guess they care because it's a nice, it, like, it's a nice theater. It's, it's, it's kind of crazy. It's like once you go to like one of those nice theaters and like, especially if you're seeing a movie that, you know, maybe you're not like really interested in who it is so comfortable. It's like, wow, we really elevated the experience here just to make sure I'll really enjoy it, even if I don't enjoy the movie. Well, that, that's that been the thing I've been saying for a while now, not that anyone's listening to me, but like, if you want people to go back into the theaters, like make the theater experience better. Like the Century City Mall, oh, that yeah. AMC <laughs> is amazing. Yeah. Like all the screens are great. The audio is great. I went to the... um a dip i can't remember where and it, but like i could tell the center channel was out so all the dialogue was super quiet and i'm like looking around like should i say something and my friend uh my girlfriend specifically was like i can't what do you mean and i was like you can't hear how muffled the center channel is she goes i don't even know what you're talking about and i was like i god it bugged me for so long because i'm now i'm sitting here going maybe we should have subtitles <laughs> Yeah, well, it's, oh yeah, well, I feel like at home, there's certain shows where I just have to put on the subtitles. Like, I don't. I can't, like, I need it, because I'm going to miss, like, half the things, so. I, it's a weird uh, thing that started happening where, like, everyone needs subtitles, and people want to say it's because stuff's mixed bad, but I, part of me thinks it's just because you're watching on TV speaker, not you, but, like, people are just watching on TV speakers, which are notoriously bad, which also, like, TV manufacturers need to figure, I shouldn't, the customer shouldn't have to buy a sound bar or whatever, a surround sound system yeah. to like experience. Like the fact that they're just focused on displays is kind of the same thing with theater. Like let's class it up a little bit so that the experience for the oh. customer is a little better. Um, sure. But it's hard because like I'm always thinking of, you know, as a filmmaker, I'm like, I want to focus on the acting and it's hard to like mm -hmm. 
do this move, you know, all right, what's the, are they crying? All right, back to the dialogue, back, what are they doing? Okay, back, you know, personally, I find that difficult, but I'm also stuck in my ways, I suppose. Now you're, there you go. The, uh, I was, I was looking, uh, stuff up about you cause I'm a journalist and, uh, oh, cool. uh, yeah, doing a little research, uh, you're from here, but you went to school in Chicago. I did. Yeah. Um, uh, that, you know, I, I think people nowadays think of, uh, filmmaking being all LA, New York, and now Atlanta, but Chicago has a huge film like history, you know, not just, uh, what's his face, uh, breakfast club, but like, um, Chicago has always been like a film hub. Was that like part of your, um, decision to go there or did that help you in any way when you were an undergrad? I mean, it, it definitely helped, but I think for me just growing up in LA and, you know, all my family is here, it's really nice to just kind of go somewhere else and just try something new. So what I loved about Chicago is you have that like Midwestern hospitality, like everyone's just really nice. And to be in a city where you can kind of walk everywhere or you can just ride your bike public transportation is actually awesome <laughs> right. the, to say the least so on, minus, minus minus the weather obviously the weather was a little rough you know i had to learn what layers were right. um that was like you got that layers. dp puffy early <laughs> no it was like wow but like getting like outfits that actually were functional like right. forget like having my half ass sweater or like pants like no no i need to be warm so I think um, just moving to Chicago was a good way of just kind of growing up and kind of being away from everything I knew. And it was nice. I ended up like right out of film school. I worked on all the shows out there just because like it's it's definitely a growing network, but it's not that big. So it's pretty easy to like jump on shows. And I worked as like an electrician out there. I did a lot of those like Dick Wolf shows. Nice. And just a lot of like procedurals, which is fun. So you just like, you get in the routine of like just the, the day to day. Minus winter. It was honestly one of the, my favorite times ever. Yeah. I, so right before we got on, like 15 minutes before we got on, I was talking to Michael Cioni, uh, who he, uh, oh, I know her. Yeah. He started Light Iron, Frame My Other, yeah. now this company Strata. And a lot of our conversation was about AI because that's his new, not generative AI, the the like workflow AI, you know, tagging things yeah. and searching. But one thing we were talking a lot about was like iteration. And that's something I was it's just kismet that I can kind of talk to you about this because you've worked on, like you were saying, those types of shows, procedurals and stuff like that. But also you've done now a lot of documentary and commercials. And I was wondering, like, what does iteration look like in those two different environments to you? Because obviously on a procedural, I or even just, any, again, those like 40 season shows, they're, they are very reticent to change anything with the workflow, let alone like lighting and stuff. I've, I can't remember who I was interviewing, but they were like, oh, yeah, we were stuck on like the F-23. I think it was like Bridgerton. They were like on the F-23 yeah. forever because they just didn't. They were like, well, let's not fuck with success here, you know? Oh, yeah, no, I mean, I was... I mean, that was a really big thing because like, so I, I worked in Chicago as an electrician, but then I came back to LA and I was worked as a camera assistant and I did shows like Jane the Virgin and like Brooklyn Nine-Nine and Major Crimes. And a lot of those shows, like we would just do the same things that they would do every season long, or even like a lot of my friends that worked on Jane the Virgin, they all did desperate. So it was like literally that crew jumped on to do Jane the Virgin and they were all doing everything like exactly the same. And I think kind of through that repetition, it made me want to just go shoot. Like I really wanted to just go do something creative and kind of break that norm of it's like the closest thing of having a nine to five job in our industry. And it was really nice going to AFI and kind of starting over with my career. And then obviously like leaving AFI and like trying to figure out that next stage of my career, I really stumbled into like the short films, the commercials, and then obviously like the docs. And then at times like when you're shooting docs, like 
it could just be you and like one other person. And it's like kind of that fight or flight mode of like, how are we going to tell the story to the best of our ability? So it's, it's fun. I definitely, between different projects, I kind of balance that big scale life to like back with your friends. So fun. Yeah. was there on those bigger shows, uh, or like the longer form ones, mm -hmm. uh, not longer form, but you know, the ones that go forever. Did you learn anything from those experiences that had been polished up and didn't need uh iteration that you applied to like the smaller uh indie gigs or doc gigs or whatever for sure i mean i think the big thing when you're on a bigger show it's organization like mm -hmm. everyone even though you have so many people like everyone has a role and it's because you do the same thing every day it makes it so easy. So a lot of times when I'm going to my smaller jobs, it's really trying to find ways to kind of build that sense of organization, even if it's like, all right, I'm doing these three jobs and then now you're doing these two jobs. Uh, I think because I was a camera assistant for so long, I became very OCD of like, we should organize like this, this, and this. Um, so. The... Uh what were some of those camera assistant things that uh, made you a better DP or that you, you've instilled in your ACs now? Um, it's, it's funny. I feel like when you work as an AC, it's, it typically is just like you and another assistant kind of, and you kind of build that sense of mentorship, just really training under one person or it's like one person right underneath you. And I think for me, especially going into a lot of my, my other projects, my more independent projects is kind of figuring out that personality of like, who is my AC and like, what do they need to thrive? Or, um, like a lot of times, like on kind of a different tangent, like I feel like I'm able to adapt more, especially when the camera isn't built correctly, or it's like, we don't have all the tools we need. Mm. I'm able to kind of adapt a little quicker. Yeah. The, the, this is something I'm trying to get better at with these interviews, which is asking about the straight up, not pretty, I suppose, like leadership position as being a department head, like being a DP. Um, mm -hmm. were there any kind of challenges when you made the switch or did that, uh, you know, uh, gaffing electrician AC thing kind of in give you the tools to just kind of straight out of the gate, be a better leader? Well, I mean, I think it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's definitely, it's definitely a hard one. I think when I decided to start shooting, I think the hardest thing I started encountering was I couldn't go back. Like a lot of the people I used to work with now considered me a DP. And then with that, I didn't have anything to kind of fall back on. You know, because like a lot of times you're trying to move up and you're like, well, I kind of need help here. Or it's like, I kind of need a paycheck. Um, so it was a very hard truth of like, hey, now I have literally nothing to fall back on. So it's like, I have to make sure every project I shoot counts. And that meant, you know, really listening and really collaborating with people. So it was more really about just kind of building relationships with other filmmakers and that was going to be my ticket to slowly getting back to bigger jobs um but yeah i feel like the idea of leadership is like uh, it kind of evolves like as you move from project to project i don't feel like there's ever like a point where you're like oh my god i'm like a great leader it's it's, it's more of like there's a moment where you kind of feel responsible for everyone that's working underneath you and you're just doing whatever you can to make sure they're set up for success. And at times, like especially on my lower budgets, it'll be like, hey, I'll cut my pay to make sure they have what they need to, uh, you know, kind of move forward. Yeah. There was there was something that you had mentioned. Actually, the all right. So one thing about this podcast is I jump around a lot. So Oh, oh you're good. No, this feels like such rapid fire. And I, I, I yeah, like sorry. because I feel like a, my last few um, interviews that I've done have been like so like 
it's it's a, it's very much about the gutter and like the specifics of like we did this, we did this, we did right. this. Where you're asking you to think, and I'm like, okay, I'm ready for it. Let's Perfect. <laughs> uh, well, the other thing too is I couldn't get a screener yeah. for the gutter, so I can't even ask about yeah. specific things anyway. Uh, but that's happened every time they email me about like, hey, do you want to interview South by Southwest people, or do you want to interview you know what any other festival? I'm like, yeah, can I get a screener? And they're usually like, nope. I'm like, cool. Well, yeah. I mean, like, it's a, it's definitely been a tough one just because like that that project like we shot in 22 and that was my debut feature and then it's just been in post for so long and yeah. i mean this is a conversation in itself but the idea of getting a feature and then getting another feature is like you need to have a feature to get a feature right you know? so it was kind of tough like having that in my back pocket for so long and you're just kind of opening up other avenues of like okay well, I've done this, this, and this. Like, would that work? And they're like, eh, I don't know. And they're like, oh, you're Kelvin. Yeah. So it, it, it ends up, you have to interview like a lot more for a project. Right. So. Um. Well, the the thing I wanted to ask, because I had heard in an interview from a while ago, podcast, um, and you had just mentioned it recently, uh, the idea of wanting to get out and shoot and kind of do more creative stuff. And I was wondering if you could hone in on that a little bit, because something I'm finding with younger filmmakers now is a, and I certainly did this, but it, it feels more um, prevalent now, is this uh, addiction to gear and aesthetics and almost completely devoiding themselves of the artistic element. And I mean that as, as like being an artist, like taking on that sort of, I suppose, lifestyle and thinking like, like an artist and, and, um, so yeah, I was wondering kind of if you could uh, elucidate what you meant by doing creative stuff. Because many would think like, oh, you were on a bunch of TV shows. That's creative. You know? Sure. Yeah. I I mean, I think it's it, it was more of kind of building my building my career as a, a DP. And the best way to do that was to actually like start back down the ground zero which is super tough, especially like the older you are and the more established you are at times, like in the industry, it's pretty tough to kind of say no to the paying job and try to pick jobs that fulfill you creatively. As so, opposed to commercially. Yeah. And I, I think it kind of, it's more of like taking a work in the mirror and figuring out at the end of the day, what kind of projects do you want representing you you know because at times your projects are going to speak for you as well as that's that's your name on those projects so i think i wanted to kind of reset my world and i wanted to kind of figure out how i could be a better storyteller and i think by going to afi that really helped a lot all the because, AFI grads on this pod like seem to just immediately jump off into doing dope shit. Like <laughs> that place it's, seems it's, to be a wonderful uh, it, option if you can get it. Yeah, I mean, I I mean, I highly recommend it. Or just even the idea of grad school because it's like grad school is like, all right, I'm going back again. Like I've already done school, but now I'm going back again with a mission. And I think being in that environment with other filmmakers that were in that same boat mm -hmm. of that kind of quarter life crisis, you're able to kind of, um, what do you call it? Um, my God, it's going to kill me. What is it? Trauma bond. <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, in, in, in a way. And I think, honestly, through those years of making shorts just to make shorts again, it kind of revived the love of filmmaking for me. I think I kind of lost it when I was working on TV shows and it was all about the paycheck and it was just like, okay, who am I working with? But now every time I'm like booking a project, I'm so excited for those projects. Like there's just like a new level of energy that kind of comes into it just because I get to kind of create it from the ground zero. Yeah. 
Well, and, and kind of what spurred that thought was when you were saying like, oh, I'll take a pay cut to make sure the project is good. And I think especially when you're starting, I've certainly run into this where it's like, even if it's a sick project, like a lot of times you need that extra, what, you know, even if it's like 200 bucks, like you, you're like, fuck, I can't take a haircut on this. Like one of the things that I, I don't recommend to anyone, but something that I was privileged enough to do is like, I have a decent amount of gear Mm -hmm. so I can rent that out. And then if I, to like on the project that I'm shooting sound equipment, I mean, literally a whole bunch of random shit. And then if they can't afford that, I will just not charge them for that gear. I already own it. I don't care. Uh, and then I can at least keep my day rate stable and then just like all right well we'll just make it look good because i don't need to nickel and dime someone over a lens you know if that's just gonna annoy them and not make the project good yeah i mean i think of honestly a big thing with that though is like really picking and choosing res projects and understanding like who to invest that relationship with and like those favors Mm. especially for those like short films like a lot of times we'll pull favors for camera or lighting gear for crew and the people that or i found like my directors that treated the rest of the crew with a ton of respect like that crew has come back on like project after project and it's like a cool little family that keeps building with every bigger project we get so it's 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 nice to go back down to that scale and it was funny even that like when I was at AFI, it was like my first film project. They call it like a visual essay. I brought out a lot of my friends from major crimes, like all the TV show. That's guys. cheating. That's cheating. I know. It's all it's all in shooting. But but it was funny because they were so excited to see me in that leader role. Mm. Like to see their faces and also they treated me like a DP. Like you would have thought, like, I've known these people for 10 plus years. Like, they literally call me Little Bear. Like, I was just always that, that kid on set. And for them to come out to operate for me, to key for me, like, it meant the world. And they were so happy to be there, even though it was like a free project. So it was a nice kind of like full circle moment to see all these people that you respected come do a solid for you. Yeah. Do you... Uh, this is something I was thinking about recently, uh, just personally, which is I have like a little list I've made of like, depending on the budget, like what are the most important crew, you know, and like, who can you not like one of them was always like crafty has to be like, no matter what, like (laughs) if you fucking order pizza, I swear to God, I'm going to pull your head off. Um, but I was wondering, you know, bouncing around like bigger projects, smaller projects and all that, like, is there like a optimum crew size there are like what are like the positions that you think like need to be on every shoot because certainly like you can get a something that just balloons where you're shooting a two-person thing at a cafe and there's 400 people on set and you're just like this is this is slowing us down or yeah. conversely you know you're on a small shoot and you just everyone's wearing too many hats everyone's stressed out and it's not moving effectively you know it it's it's funny because i feel like i have to balance that a lot where you're doing like a small project for a friend and it's like i mean like i it literally just can't be you and me like there has to be me at least a gaffer a key like at least a three-person writing team and a focus puller that's like the bare minimum for the smaller projects and then i definitely owe them a job after that i always feel bad like i'm like wow i am so sorry for like that small of a crew and then i'm like the other side of the world, it's honestly figuring out kind of what you're shooting and to what degree will kind of determine how many people you need. And then I've also found is who is your director and like who are your producers? Because sometimes I work with directors who, you know, they want to see like a lot of people. Like I've done a lot of, I've done commercial stuff where they're like, we just want to make it, we want it to look busy. For the Um, client? Yes. For the client. I actually, I I had a job last year where we had to do something like that. And I was like, sure. We need two mad boxes on that camera. Just please. Like that, that level of stuff. So, I mean, I think 
it obviously depends on like the budget and the scale, but it really comes down to what we're shooting. It's like if we're shooting just a single person in a bedroom, like you don't need the craziest crew ever. You know, it's like that's when you can go back to basics. Not like how skimpy my first crew was, but like, you know, a reasonable three on three on both sides for lighting and kind of a full camera team. Yeah, that that is such an interesting line have, you have to toe with the like, it's not always a client, but there's always like someone you're trying to impress with stupid shit. Like, like I know it, the, the common one is just like, oh, if I walk and me and Michael were just talking about this, uh, you know, you walk onto set with whatever, a DSLR and, you you know, an FX3, whatever, and you know, it's going to okay. look good. But then who, someone, you have to impress somebody. So you end up putting all this random gack on it just to make it look, or you bring in a big camera, just even though it's more expensive to rent, you're like, but they'll be happy if they see big mm -hmm. camera and it's yep. maybe the workflow's worse. And it's, it's such an intro, like. It, that, it, it, it's, it's really about figuring out who is your group of collaborators. You know, like sometimes it is about the camera. It is about kind of fulfilling a dream or being on a bigger job and then others are like i want to strip apart everything and i just want it to be you and me and the actor in the room so it's it's kind of fun having to reinvent the wheel every time because you never know with each project kind of where you're going to go what tools you're going to use or it's funny. There's a lot of times where it's like, I would love to have a dolly, but instead I'm on like rolling spreaders and a slider. Right. And we're like adding more to the slider, but it's a little rough, you know? So it's like, you're kind of finding ways to make the dollar go a lot farther than it really does. Yeah. Well, it's a customer service thing too, right? Like uh, a lot of my uh, friends and, and like my old roommate who I mention a lot uh, owns bars I'd shoot stuff for this uh, cocktail group called Death & Co. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, this is Jack. Oh, right. Death Co. Uh, I've been wanting to go to Death & Co. It's so good. Dog, it, whenever you, like, yep. literally let me know. We were just there a couple of days ago. Like, let me know. We'll go. Yeah. Okay, we're going to we're gonna sidebar. Yeah. I do really want to go. Okay. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, uh, actually, this this is kind of a great sidebar. They The thing I love about Death first of all, the food, the drinks are the best you'll have, Right. They're not mm -hmm. horrifically expensive. Obviously, nowadays, things have kind of gotten more expensive in general, but a um, little pricier than average. But the thing that they nail is customer service. It's mm -hmm. going there feels effortless. Like they they just, their, their attention to detail is so specific and they've built it into their company culture. Like you don't get hired there unless you buy into their uh, core values, as they call them. They're, they work with this, yeah. that, that part of the Gotcha. Yeah, sure. Um and so they they do great at hiring and they, and they instill this working this idea of working to code not to i mean yes to make their product better their their experience better but it's it's all customer focused and you know um there's this book i don't know if they go off this book but there's this book called unreasonable hospitality um okay. which actually did you see the second season of the bear of course so you know yeah, that I love, I love the show you know the episode where Cousin goes to the fancy restaurant and meets Olivia Coleman? Mm -hmm. So that restaurant is a visual representation of that book. Mm -hmm. Apparently the the bar owner or the restaurateur, the chef, whoever it was, um, someone was like, oh yeah, we, I think the restaurant was in New York. And they're like, we were planning on going to the beach, but there's like a tornado or something. So we came here. Or they, you know, they, they were telling him on the phone or something. So he put sand in the entire restaurant. No. And for, like unreasonable hospitality. Right. Uh, wow. And I, and I, and I'm just fascinated by that idea. And I love stealing from other things like, um, the, the business consultant that death and co uses is how I got, actually, that's how I got introduced to the business consultant was through death and co, but, uh, this system called EOS, which is just about business management. Or like this dude Jocko writes this thing about um, uh, leadership and running teams and stuff. And I just love stealing from other industries and trying to figure out how to make it film centric. Um, and I so mean, but you're 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 totally right. I mean, a lot of times I feel like being a DP, you are this like 
hospitality meets therapist. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why. You know, you're you're kind of taking everyone's kind of thoughts and concerns and you're kind of helping alleviate some of the pain or the stress. So, so yeah. it ever ends. Well, and it's the it's the thing they don't teach you in film, at least they, not maybe at AFI, but the, at Arizona State Film School in two thousand nine, they did not teach us. <laughs> it's 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 one of those things of like once you do, then you start to experience it, and you're like, okay, like how could I have been better in that situation? Or maybe I work better with certain personalities, and I think that's what film school or just some of those earlier projects are for is being in a space where you can work with different people very quickly and kind of build a foundation of like what you need to thrive you know i definitely like i work with people that need like they either need like a lot of attention or i'll work with someone who's just really artistic and then they don't know the technical side it's it's kind of like as a dp you kind of fill in the blanks more than not yeah. Well, and it's like trying to find everyone's strengths and lean into them versus trying to make them do something they're not like accustomed to, I guess. Yes. 100%. Yeah. Uh, let's see. I have notes here. Oh, this is something completely, again, we're bouncing all over the place. Uh, here we go. For whatever reason, a lot of DPs love architecture. And I guess you dodged that bullet. I I mean like I I do love I do love architecture, but it's so close to home for me. Like, right, because it's like my share of family, right? It's 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 literally my whole family. Like both my parents and my sister are architects, and like either our family text chain. It's half the time I like most of the time I get the jokes, but then there's times where it's so specific. Um, but. I think what has been a lot of fun is by jumping into film, my family has never been more excited for me. Like it's so close to what they do, but also so far away. Um, but yeah, we look at buildings a lot and we'll look at lighting. And my dad just has a ton of architecture books, um, just like a huge library. And it's always really fun to kind of go through books and kind of look at how light kind of goes through spaces. Yeah. Is there, I guess that's like the main lesson you can take from architecture, right? Is just like how light interacts with rooms and looks good. Cause that's like the whole, that's half the battle with, I don't know shit about architecture, but like, I assume that's half the battle is like, I know what's his name, the f super famous one, Bay area, um, mostly or like California, Frank Lloyd Wright. Like he's always like angling. I assume they all do this, but that's the only one I know. Uh, you know, always angling buildings so that the sun at certain times like creates patterns and stuff like that. Like, w did you, was any of that knowledge instilled into you that kind of like informed the way you light spaces? I mean, I would say a bit to a degree. It's, there's something super interesting if you're able to kind of sit in a space and understand what it looks like at different times of day. And especially as a DP, if you can work with the AD and really kind of schedule what is the optimal time to shoot something, you know, it's such a game changer because a lot of times, like you just working with the AD or even the PD, like if the space is already kind of lit or it's already kind of designed, you know, like you don't have to do as much. Like you're not starting from scratch mm. a lot. And I think. A lot of times the architecture is a part of the story. Depending on the type of story you're telling, it could be a character or it could resemble a character of how these people feel in their spaces. So it's it's a it's a lot of fun. I love vocational scouting and kind of really fine tuning spaces for our specific needs. Or you're making up a whole space and I'll break this. It's it's definitely like the fifty fifty. What are, uh, I don't think I've asked this of anyone, but like, what are some of the tools you use, uh, in a pre-production or scout scenario? Are there any things that like help you, uh, work more efficiently? Oh, uh, I, I carry my iPad a lot. And then on my iPad, I 
I doodle a lot. I'm not a great doodler, but I do like to kind of draw and kind of sketch out things. Um, I'm trying to think of a name. I think it's hologram. hologram. It's, it's going to drive me crazy. But there is an app where you can you take photos of the space and it can redesign the space in 3D, which is... Is that the one where you like scan it? You like scan yeah, the room? Kind of, yeah, you, you're like scan the room. And then you add, to, I think you're right. It's like poly something, whatever. Oh, it's good. Yeah. That, and then I mainly use just like notability and I'll just kind of like get just rough ideas. And then obviously Artemis and like Cat Ridge, but more than not, it's trying to get on the same page with the director. Like, what are they seeing? How are they seeing the space? And I feel like my trick or this was like a lesson I learned really early on. I feel like a lot of times people will walk into rooms and they'll always put on a 0.5 on their iPhone right. and take a photo of the space. And I'm like, that is a lie. That space is not that big. Right. And you and I are both going to forget that it's not that big. So it's more like shooting at the one and no matter how uncomfortable it is, like that is the true size of the space. Yeah. Um, so my, I feel like at times my photos are horrible, but that's how you want to see it. You want to see it in the worst light possible so you can kind of come back and do your best work. You know, what's funny is I was talking to Hoyta uh, a few months ago and uh, on the podcast, we're not friends. Uh, <laughs> I'd love to be friends with him, but either. Yeah. Anyway. Um, but I, you know, I had noticed in all these behind the scenes photos, he had like a Leica around his neck and I thought he was doing the DP thing of just like taking cool photos and stuff. And he goes, oh no, I don't even save photos on it. I literally will just set up the scene, take a picture, show it to Chris and be like, that's basically what it'll look like. Cause they're shooting Phil. I didn't even think about it. He's got a digital Leica just to like, it's like the old Polaroid move. No, I've, I've actually done that a lot for shooting film. Like just having a camera, just like a digital camera that has like the same shutting. This is like a quick glance because you're trying to get everyone else comfortable with what you're doing. And especially when it comes to film, like you and the gaffer and like you and your lighting team and camera team are like the only people that really know what it's going to kind of look like. Which and everyone else is just like running around with their heads shut down. So you're like, here's like a general idea of what it's going to kind of look like. But it's going to look a lot better than this um, yeah. yeah um years ago i did work for work that as a camera assistant oh no shit he was, he was the most relaxed guy i've ever worked and he just he's so sweet and he just really respects his crew so it's like man you want to be someone like that right. who's like you're shooting the biggest thing ever but you're still well, hugging everyone around you so it's it's really admiring. I think I think something that happened to him naturally, but I think kind of going back to what you're saying about like, uh, I almost said overgrad, postgrad, uh, mm -hmm. is approaching art or filmmaking later in life. Because like when I went to college, I didn't spend. I immediately got a job at Red Bull, and I thought that was going to be like I I I abandoned filmmaking. So I still was in film school, but I was like that. Ah, this is more fun. This is real. And it's like, if I would have started in the industry, then I would have fucked up so bad. I would like, I would probably not be working today just because I was so scatterbrained. I didn't know how to work with people. I didn't, you know, I had a not necessarily a big head on my shoulders, but uh, you know, like anyone who's in their late teens, you know, you, you think you know everything. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I think about that all the time. I, I have thought about it because I know so many friends that have gone from undergrad straight to grad school. And it's so cool to kind of see their careers. I'm like, wow, you're so young. But there's that part of me where I really enjoyed working in the industry and kind of getting a sense of how the industry works, how to kind of navigate it, how to understand just different people as, you know, you are the youngest kid on set. Right. Um, so it, it's really interesting to kind of look back at, you know, some of my colleagues that went straight from undergrad to grad 
and then some that didn't go to film school or the ones that just only were shooting and never crewed. Um, I mean, there's no like proper way of moving up to the industry, but it's that zigzag is really fascinating. Yeah. I just realized it's very dark in my room now. Good Lord. Uh, oh no, I, I no, it's all good. I just looked at the screen. I was like, oh my God, like, can we, well, it's overcast anyway. Um, who are you, who are your, like, uh, I know you did the, the ASE vision mentorship program, but prior to that, who were the like DPs that you kind of, for lack of a better term, wanted to steal from? Oh, stealing from everyone. <laughs> um, I had the pleasure of being, I mean, I still have the pleasure of Amy Benson, ASC. Yeah, I interviewed her. Oh, sure. She's rad. Yeah, Laurel. Yeah, no, she's been a mentor for me for years. And uh, I think a lot of a lot of female DPs, I've had the pleasure of like crewing under that ended up really supporting me as a DP. Like you got Holly Morgan, you got Kara Kelly, Sophia Puchek. Um, yeah, no, it's I I feel like I had the pleasure of just working with and under so many female DPs and just other DPs like. It's very really nice to kind of see some of their mistakes or just see some of their trials and tribulations and really kind of learn all those mistakes. And then also just having someone to call, being like, I don't know what I'm doing. I need help. Or what do you think of this? And I think it's it's funny the longer you're in the industry, sometimes it's easier to kind of find those people to really connect with that kind of understand your journey or where you want to go with your journey. Yeah. The, uh, kind of on a more technical side, uh, what were some of the things, cause you know, you go to school you, and you learn three point lighting or whatever, but working in the, in the lighting department, uh, and working under, you know, other DPs, like what are some, uh, maybe. I guess this only really works for like the commercial side of things, but like, you know, constantly you, you kind of go back to, to make sure the image looks good. Like the, like that pixel, uh, spot you shot looks incredible. Uh, and I imagine you didn't just go outside and shoot it. Well, <laughs> that one, that one was a, that was a tough one because you don't think that the observatory or you forget, like it's all white. And I remember the client, they were saying, we want it to look good, but not too good. I, was like, I hate okay. that note. I hate, I hear it all okay. the time. And then also the observatory had like a lot of strict rules of like what we can put on the grass and just kind of, um, just our overall like manpower up there had to be super limited. So it's funny for that one. It was about timing. It was about really putting our, ourselves into spaces where we weren't going to shoot ourselves in the foot at noon. Mm. Like if we can get there, if we could shoot the sequence between nine and 10 30, the sun will be here. We'll just do a little bounce and we'll call it quits. It's funny. A lot of times it's almost like figuring out what do you really need to make a project? Um, Cause sometimes less is more. And that project is an example of, we definitely use less, even though it was like a bigger job and we did have a lot of toys, we ended up using a lot less. Was it just like a 12 by bounce on it? Cause it looks, the, the reason I brought that one up is cause it yeah. looks so polished, but just from me knowing stuff, I was like, I bet that was not a lot Ooh. of like, I bet that wasn't a bunch of 12 Ks. <laughs> You know, no, we have we we did a couple sequences where we threw out like black satin or like half soft routes like overhead, and we did do some like low bounces, but not. It's crazy because the the building is so white. We actually were trying to black out some of that building, like the bounce from a lot of the observatory is just crazy. So it was a lot of like adding more neg and then even just being up at the Hollywood sign, 
at that point in the day, I think everyone was also super dehydrated. Like we were just like, it's fine. We just need to bounce and I think we'll get by. Yeah. It is fun. Yeah. Well, that also brings up something that, uh, we've mentioned a lot on this podcast, which is post. I was going to mention coloring. Hold on. I do. I just remembered the yeah. very, very first episode of this was with my neighbor, Johnny Durango. He shot a movie called fat man oh, where, I love her. Oh yeah. He, he lives across the street from me. Oh yeah. We hear, um, it's funny. There's a, a lot of my friends from Chicago, we all kind of still connect and we're all DPs, but every month we do get breakfast. And I met Johnny there and it was just like such a small world of like, how we've never met. Like this is super cool. But the three of us can go to death and co then I'll just knock on the door. But, uh, one, so the whole movie that he shot was in the snow and what he, uh, mentioned, yeah. And now your room's getting dark. (laughs) I know. I was like, I'm going to slowly turn on a light. Yeah. Um, You could talk to her. But, uh, one thing that he had mentioned was, uh, he thought he was going to have to bounce a lot, but instead what he ended up doing was putting like frost on one side and neg on the other and had the subject a stop under the snow and then everything looked yeah. good. And I was like, that's interesting because I would have done the opposite. I would have tried to go stop over the snow, but he said that looks like shit and it doesn't look natural. That, I mean, that makes sense because when you think of snow, like if it is like fresh snow, like it is really bright. It's the zone system. Yes. Yeah, like it's so obvious, and I just never would have thought of it. No. Um, and then I forgot where we were going because I got excited about Johnny. What the hell did I? Oh, Johnny! I'm so bad at this. 150 episodes. Um, well, that one's gone. About what was it? It was about uh, uh, what you were saying. Working on uh, less is more. People are dehydrated. I give up. Um. Yeah. I did want to ask the about you've had so many films in festivals and uh, I was wondering kind of what you this is sort of a loaded question, but like what are the importance of festivals versus just like making something with your friends to trying to find a, a distributor, maybe not finding them, you know, putting it on YouTube, whatever. Like why, why are festivals so important in an, in an era where I feel like they don't get as much attention by the by the general community? Um, I mean, I feel like as as a DP, festivals are super important, and if you have the time, it's really important that you go. Um, I think there's something about having that full cycle with a film of like you're in preps for a film, you shoot a film, you color a film, but there's nothing sweeter than like watching a film and then watching people react. To that film and i think seeing people react to it that's where you kind of build that momentum or you kind of build that hype of people tend to start or like people get excited about projects that you work on and i think most times like when we're shooting a short or a feature or something like we're really trying to get into one of those like top tier festivals and then when you do, it is, I, I like my thesis, for example, like that was like a crazy story in itself of that film just took forever to make just because it was a pandemic film. And mm. to have that premiere at Sundance was like the sweetest thing ever, just for everyone on that team. But we all kind of stayed together on in um, Park City, and it just made it super special. So I think, especially as an up-and-coming filmmaker, I think it's super important to, if you even if you don't have a project at a, fe- at a festival, you should go to festivals and you should kind of see, like, what movies are getting screened. Yeah. Like, what type of projects are out there. And I definitely cold called directors and producers and It's more about like, hey, like, I really loved your project. I was super excited about it. Not necessarily like I want to work with you, but I think at times people need that acknowledgement of like, hey, they did something tough. And it's nice to be, to kind of like pat your back, pat your shoulder in a way. So 
it was a very loaded question. I'm trying to like answer and still like think about that question, but I don't know. I feel like I'm, I'm still learning too of like that festival experience. Yeah. Well, the, the leading end of that question is what my answer is, which is like, I, for the longest time, I just didn't go, I didn't even have an opinion on them. But I knew I wasn't going to like Sundance anytime soon just because I couldn't afford it. You know, but uh, even smaller festivals like, you know, whatever, yeah. Ojai Film Festival, like my buddy got into Ojai, went to a couple others, got nominated for an Emmy. Like, you know, it, yeah. and it was a, it was quick. Like he worked on that movie for it was a documentary for like four years. And then in yeah. one year, he's sitting in the Emmys, you know, Um but also not just about getting your own project in there, but I found that like, if you, if you go on Reddit ever, which I can't recommend anymore, then <laughs> the, it's a lot of people going like, where do I meet? I hate the phrase like-minded individuals. And then I'm like, oh, yeah. festivals, don't mm -hmm. find them on Reddit. It's a bunch of people asking, where do I meet people and have no idea what they're doing? Festivals are where you're going to meet people who are doing it and interested also, in collaborating. I mean, people at festivals want to meet people. Yeah. Because I feel like when you're just walking around LA, I don't want, you don't want to meet anyone right now. Like I kind of want to just get caught, you know, or like I'm meeting not one person, but when you're in that festival setting, like people are excited to meet other filmmakers and to kind of relate on similar subjects. So yeah. no, I, I'm a huge fan of if you can, I recommend going, you know, even if you didn't make something in that festival, it is pricey, especially the bigger festivals. But if you can go, I would go. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. Whenever people ask, like, what do I do? Depending on where I am, I'll just be like, I'm a journalist. Cause it's still technically true. I write for pro video coalition. Yeah. That, that counts. But I was, cause anytime you say DP, they're like, Ooh, anything I would have seen. You're like, no, I shoot fucking corporate ads. I was second unit on the, a movie. No one saw like, <laughs> No one, it's not fun to talk about. It is with someone who knows what you're talking about, but just the average person, you know. Yeah. Um, but you did say what reminded me of that other thing I was going to talk about, which was uh, when we were talking about the, the pixel thing and uh, more is uh, less is more. Something we've mentioned a million times in the podcast is how important the colorist has become because the camera, as Steve Yedlin says, is just a data collection device at this point. Like you can put so much uh, of your artistic influence into, you know, so much contrast or whatever lighting, but if there's data in those shadows, they can bring them up and wash out your contrast or whatever. Or in, I would assume the case of the pixel ad or any of these like higher end, um, ads specifically, but also movies like they can make them sing. And so I was wondering what your, um, uh, interaction has been with some of the, you know, maybe these shorts or whatever with the colorist, are you kind of just a little more hands off? Are you in there a lot? I, if I can, I love being part of the DI. Um, it's actually one of my favorite parts. I get to look at all my mistakes. Yeah. And <laughs> all, of my, so. all, yes. no, all of my colorists that I've worked with are, they're all just so sweet as individuals. And it's nice to rewatch the movie and learn her eyes where they're like, what was happening here? What, you know, like it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. And, if I can make a lot with them beforehand, that's always a game changer because then we're all on the same page with the look. And then when we're getting to color, it's more about balancing things. But as an up and coming filmmaker, it's a really interesting relationship because I would say for like the short films and the more independent projects, I really get to kind of pick and choose my colorists and I get to really grow with them. But then for some of the bigger projects, it goes in the hands of the producer or like the production company, or it's just like a big client. So they're, they're just going with their go-to person. So in those circumstances, you're just trying to shoot actually in all, you're just trying to shoot the healthiest image possible right. and close enough to the look that you want. Um, and then you're just hoping it stays in that vein, which is like so tough, but yeah, I like, 
for the gutter, I worked with Walter Valpato, and I've done a couple of projects best. with him. I've he's taken some uh, group lessons from him. Yes. Now, he's, he's such a delight. And yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot of colors that I've worked with that they only make me better. Like they tend to question the work and then together we kind of find like a happy medium and we get to build off it. Yeah. I, I, I just looked down and I noticed I had a different note about, I was looking at your Instagram and, uh, you had, you had some stills from a, a film or a short called inner demon. Mm -hmm. That was also our light South by. Oh, was that, was that the second one? Yeah. Oh, okay. second one. So, uh, I was wondering, that's perfect then. So I was wondering if you could, granted only the people at South by have seen it, but if you could maybe compare and contrast the approaches to either film, um, yeah. you know, how, how, uh, the approach to lighting was what the look was intended to be on either one. You know, I assume inner demons of horror. <laughs> Hey, you know, I feel like the title kind of just yeah. throws it out of the gate. Um, so Inner Demon um, is a short film that deals with a girl who is obviously struggling with her inner demon. It's, it's going kind of straight to the point. Mm. And great, great. Work. Early, or, <laughs> thank you. I know. I, I don't know. I'm a DP. But our, earlier on, uh, Jasmine, the director and I, we talked about how interesting it is shooting like a horror thriller during the day mm. like there's something kind of scary experiencing things during the day when you can see things and it, it's kind of that feeling where it's like the sun is coming through the windows but it's not coming all the way through you know it's like there is that ominous kind of feel so like we kind of riff off that concept of how can you make things feel unknown or scary during the day? And the story, it's such a simple story where it goes from being in a bathroom to a bedroom to a bathroom. And we had like a really small crew for that. It was like a two day shoot. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, no, it's, 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 it's a fun project with two actors, you know, and you don't know where you're going to go with it. Whereas like the gutter what is um a studio project with Village Road Show is a big feature, you know, had month plus of prep and two cameras that you know, it it was just like on the opposite scale of projects. And for me, like I love doing that. Like doing a small independent movie, really connecting with that filmmaker and then going doing a bigger movie where I'm trying to challenge myself technically. Yeah. Well, cause with the uh, inner demon, I imagine just from the stills and, and you describing it, like you're trying to build a lot of contrast into the image. Was it all just kind of like, were you just pushing everything through a window and let no, it no, harder? We, we, so my, my gown for Matthew and my key grip, Andy, we we lit a bit through the window, but we had some light mats inside. But I think a big thing was just adding a ton of neg fill. And for this project in particular, we negged the ceiling. Like oh, we no. negged, yeah, just because it kind of cut off that little bit of extra ambient light. Sure. And typically you get that like full wrap. And for this project, it was really just letting things fall kind of into darkness and kind of really guiding lighting lines where we were looking and where we wanted you to look next. Um, and then visually, we do a lot of like fragmentation as she starts to go through the spiral. And then we also introduce prisms as she mm -hmm. kind of seems other versions of herself. So. No, it was, it was it was a fun project. It was like a fun weekend, just with a lot of friends and like a really small bedroom. Yeah. I feel like it doesn't matter like how big you get as a filmmaker, you're always back in that bedroom. Like <laughs> I feel like you're always shooting in a bedroom. I, I I have a joke with a couple of my director friends where I'm like, if you start your movie in a bedroom and they're waking up, I'm gonna lose it. Like yeah, oh yeah, the alarm clock shot. Yes, you're like, can we do anything else besides get up from bed? Or 
go to the bathroom. Why? Why? No one has a good bathroom. Massive mirror. Lighting sucks. Can't put a camera in there. I hate it. I hate it so much. There's that. Um, uh, that reminds me. Um, Bill Dill, the one of my my teachers. He He's been mentioned that. so many times on this fucking podcast. Have you have you have you heard the quote about the bathroom? No. Yeah, uh, I don't think so. Oh no! I, I'm literally only bringing him up for the bathroom quote. Okay, perfect. something I feel like I love buying, but it's the idea of when you're shooting a project, where you need to establish the space and the surroundings to get an understanding of where the character is in that environment. And it's like no matter how big the, the space is, you need to know where the bathroom is. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, I guess you're right. Like, but I tend to live by that and like. You don't want to always be kind of shooting in that medium shot. Sometimes to get that effect, you kind of need a wide or you kind of need to pull back a bit to know where they're sitting. Yeah. Yeah. And it's really easy to, uh, to just get really pretty close ups all the time. Oh, yeah. Well, the thing is, people, okay, going back to the whole festival, a lot of times, you know, you're watching on like the 17 inch monitor or like the onboard, like the seven inch or the five inch. Mm. And you forget, like, you're going to watch this in the theater. And that close up is going to look crazy yeah. on the big screen. So it's, you got to kind of remember, like, things look different on big screens compared to little screens. Yeah. Like, it's okay to have visual variety. There was, uh, I was, I can't remember. I think it was the, the, uh, the ICG 600 like awards yeah something like that and uh I remember this is like last year I remember that this has nothing to do with cinematography but it, the thing that happened in every single movie was mm -hmm. the high-pitched uh like you've lost your hearing sound mm -hmm. every oh, single movie that. had that I was like oh <laughs> no after the fourth one I was like there's 10 of these like yeah, no, I, my, my friend, Sarah, who's like my dear friend that I went to AFI with, she was, um, she shot a movie in that block. Uh, I don't know if you remember, it's called Juliet. It was the kind of like the Romeo and Juliet story. Oh yeah, no, that one was great. Oh, yeah, the, the, the girl, I mean, the, the girl in the play. Yeah. In the, uh -huh. yeah, 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 yeah. I actually, I worked on that. I would keep Did you? That. That was, yeah, that was fantastic. Fun. You know, talk about crime school. Um, but, you know, I had to support her. But it was a lot of films to watch. And I was very tired. Yeah. I was like, I like you, but you're testing me. Well, and I don't think that that event, I'm glad you went to that because now I can yes. play about it. Uh, they didn't sell the idea. First of all, they didn't tell anyone about the parking. <laughs> but yes. then they didn't sell, they didn't explain to anyone that we were going to watch all these films. I thought this was just the award ceremony and then we were all going to eat snacks. But this is how it's been for years. Um, yeah, the American cinematographers. And it, it's funny, I've applied to it a couple times, like over the years, and I never got it. So I'm like, okay, fine. I'm moving on with my life. Um, but it's crazy that we watch the entire film. And it's hard because... It's like visually it is interesting, but I'm not so engaged in the story. And then you, it goes back to my question. Is it good cinematography if I'm not engaged in the story? Right. Yeah. So. The reason I was there is because my buddy Petros, who I had had on the podcast, shot uh, that Greek one, the 4-3, about the oh, old yeah. guy. Well, that was pretty. Yeah. That was a, and he apparently he shot that forever ago. So like. He was like, that's not, he goes, that's not even what I like anymore. Like, that's not even my visual style anymore. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, it's funny. I feel like for those, like, you could just pick from the Rolodex. Um, that, that reminds me, that, was a lot. I had it been last year, but last year I was at the clubhouse, ASC clubhouse, and they do the photo series yeah. and, you know, it's all the members they can decide from their portfolio, like a photo that they want to display. And I'm looking at some of these photos and I'm like, um, this is from the sixties. Like this is not recent. Yeah. You know, like there's some that are like super recent and then some that are very dated. And then I was talking to one of my friends who's a member. She's like, oh yeah, you could just pick whatever you want from 
your like lifetime. I'm like, well, shit. Now I yeah. now like that's crazy. Well, and some of them like I was there for the Kodak Awards, and I was looking at the ones on the wall, and some of them are just like a photo of a neon bar sign, and I'm like, I, I mean, you're an incredible DP. I could have shot that. Like, I have photos of neon bar signs. Like, yeah. No, I, I, I always love those events because it's like I never can guess the DP behind the photo. Yeah. Because it's, it's always like that's personal, like their personal taste typically. And then you look up, you're like, oh, that's you know, like at lockdown. You're like, what? That's okay. That's that's crazy. Or I always wonder if it's like they just had some fun snapshots and then they were asked to be in it. They're like, well, I'm not not going to be in it. Uh, have, have this. Well, well, I had I had a one tour um, who had a photo up and he was telling me it, it was just like a long drive. He was in Europe hmm. and I was like, good for you. Like, I love this story. Yeah. Like, it, it just it felt so random, but it also felt so beautiful and so organic to who he is as a person. And I was like, oh, that's you. Like, yeah. not anyone can take a photo like that and sure. be like, sure. <laughs> well, oh, actually, that's a good question. What, uh, you know, getting into the any of the like ASC um, programs is rad. Uh, what what did the uh, what's it called? The vision mentorship program mm -hmm. what what was that experience is that like an ongoing thing is that like a class yeah. and what was that experience like or is they, it so the asc they have like a couple programs right um, I've, I've, I've done a couple they have the the asc master class which i did like years ago um that one you kind of have to pay for but it is a like i want to say it's like a week long program where you get to dive into kind of different parts of the field and meet a lot of AFC members and you get to do a lot of demos. Mm. And that's what's cool about that one is you have a lot of international um, traction, like a lot of international students kind of come out for that. Um, but the ASC mentorship program is a program where they pair you up with a mentor. Um, so I, I did that, but my mentor never really met up with me. I was like, oh, darn. Yeah. But I've, I've had a relationship. Uh, it was like we emailed and then they never really got back to me. Like they were just really busy and I was like, oh, damn. But I've, I've known some friends that have had a successful time in that program. So, I mean. The, I feel like the rule of thumb is always apply. You never know what's going to stick. So, yeah. Well, in that yeah. program, you you don't have to pay for, right? You just no. So, and it's 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 more of like you get paired up with an ASC DP, and it's not like you're asking for a job. Like you're more finding ways to navigate the industry, and yeah. you're just getting a lot of advice and. Hopefully they pair you up with someone that is in keen to what you want to do in the industry. Yeah. And not actively shooting whatever Dune. <laughs> yeah. No, that was, that was the thing. I was like, I, I met my mentor who was super awesome, but he was so busy shooting. Like he shoots a ton of television. I was like, all right, bye. Nothing against you. I mean, no one wants to see you. Yeah. That's fair. That actually brings up a, a, a side question, which is, uh, at what point did you know it was time or at what point did someone reach out to you where you were finally got representation? Because that's always a question mm -hmm. people go like, hey, you know, they think that's where the jobs come from. And unfortunately, it's not. But it is kind of like a launching point for the, a, a certain segment of your career. Yeah. I, um, when it came to representation, they reached out to me. And that's yeah. always been the advice I've gotten from a lot of my friends because you don't want to reach out. I mean, it's it's not bad reaching out to them, but you want them to be excited about you. And I met up with my agents and they were super excited 
um, um, kind of about my career and it kind of, it was like a, it was an interview at times and it was really exciting, but you know, you feel like a kid and you're like, I have nothing on my website or like my roster. So like, am I going to be at the bottom of your roster? So it was a lot of just kind of self conversing with myself, you know, figuring out, is this the right match? Mm. And I think for me, I really wanted to be with a group of people that I could grow with. And that's what I told them up front. I was like, at the time, I only had like a few shorts, but they were doing really well. But career wise, I didn't want to be pigeonholed into that specific genre. Right. Um, but then they've been great. I've really enjoyed that relationship and we've just kind of been growing throughout. And I know everyone has different relationships with their agents, but it's finding ways to have open communication with them of how are you going to move up with them? Right. Yeah. I, I was talking to Jay Holden about the same thing. And, uh, he was saying like, they have, the agent has to have something to sell you on. And if you don't have, which makes total sense, it sounds like they can't sell potential. They have to, they have, you have to have something, you know? So if, yeah. if you're trying to look like, you know, if you want to be a, uh, if you want to shoot booze ads, you got to have a booze ad on your website or else they're not going to, you know, so you kind of have to take that initial investment yourself. Oh, a hundred, hundred percent. Um, I mean, they've been great or at least like opening the door. And then once you're in there, you kind of have to fight for yourself yeah. or it, they've definitely helped with negotiating for projects and definitely reading on projects. I don't think I ever would have gotten. Um, so it's, it's, it's good, but I think I'm still learning and kind of navigating. And I think the best thing is like, if you do join an agency, like get to know the other DPs on the roster. Mm. Cause like some of those DPs are like some of my closest friends. I'm like, Oh, did you read that script? And they're like, yeah, yeah it was crazy. And I was like, nah, we don't want that one. Yeah. It's, it's, it, it becomes like a really fun conversation of like, Oh, are we going through the same things? Oh, we're not. Because the group of us, we all are very different types of DPs. Mm -hmm. So it's really interesting to kind of see how our relationship differs from the same agent. Yeah. Well, and I assume that agent, uh, any agent wants a yeah. quiver. They don't want 15 of the same DP because then, oh, sure. then, you know, then you're just all battling for the same thing. Oh, yeah. And they're not right. making any money. No, and I think like how this industry works is like you have to kind of find a way to put your personal touch on every project you do, which is at times it feels so arbitrary. You're like, how do I do that? But I find with every project, I'm able to kind of put just like a little stamp that's like, oh, okay, I think Veronica shot that project. Yeah, I mean... So to uh, example, and then other thing or in reverse, the, uh, sure. I, I was thinking about that the other day, like when you go, when maybe you go too far, like, uh, Zack Snyder, right. You know, Zack Snyder, cause it's like, he's still doing Under Armour commercials, but they're just feature length, you know? Yes. And, uh, which is rad. Like all this stuff looks rad, but. At a certain point, I imagine, because I'm not at this level, that that might pigeonhole you. Where if, if your personal touch is so specific that you only get hired to do that, yeah, um, that could potentially be frustrating. But again, I don't know. I, don't know. I, I mean, I'm, I, I really make an effort to kind of jump, jump through different genres mm -hmm. and just try to work on stories that are very different from the ones I've been telling. But, you know, you're also like, you kind of fall in love with collaborators. You know, like, right. okay, I'll do anything with you. And I really connect with this type of project. Um, but it's funny, in the last couple of years, I've been really trying to get more into commercials. And it's like catch-22 of when you shoot a lot of narrative, it's really hard to shoot commercials. Right. Vice versa. Yeah, I talk to all my commercial friends. And they're like, how do you get into narrative? And I'm like, 
trades news. Like, yeah. well, can we trade like one project? Yeah. Um, but it it is such a snowball effect, though. If you can get one, it can lead to another, which will lead to another. Um, well, and the thing I've always said is like taking small gigs usually you end up meeting someone who is also just taking a small gig, maybe not for mm-hmm. like money, but just for whatever, maybe they're doing a favor and stuff. And those will often lead to those bigger gigs or other gigs. So it's best not to like poo poo smaller stuff or, or, or say you know, you're, I, know. I mean, I feel like investing in people has been the ticket to doing bigger and better jobs. Um, like, uh, I shot a documentary like two years ago now, almost, oh my God, I think it's three years. Let's see more. It's been three years um, since we shot this documentary and it was such a personal experience um, just dealing with George Floyd and we all kind of lived together. It was like 14 days. And then now like I still talk to that director and we're about to do a commercial together. And it's really nice to uh, kind of go into the weeds with someone and then do other types of projects with them. Yeah. I think that's like the best of those ones. Did you, uh, I was going to say on the look thing, I remember this happened. What, what was it like empire of light? And I was like, yeah. man, this uh-huh. looks like a Deacon's movie. And then the it's credits beautiful. come up and I was like, oh, it is a Deacon's movie. And you know what it was? It's his tungsten yellows. I don't know what his shooting let it. Cause he always talks about how he just has like the same LUT for everything. And he just, but there's something about the yellows and like the quality of the tungsten warm light that he uses. It's always like a very specific kind of. Would you say it's like the uh, straw yellow? Yeah. I know that. Yeah. It's it's like yellow is a really hard color to produce. Um, Just when it comes to LEDs, just like it's true. Green. Yeah. So no, his work is always so pristine. And it doesn't matter like the type of subject that he's shooting. You're like, I believe that's, and it's yeah. so mundane but beautiful. I'm like, how? Well, the yeah. I, I think of like I think it was Skyfall when him and when James Bond and the uh, the lady are at the bar, and it's just orange. I mean, the whole thing is orange, but it still has so much separation, and so like it doesn't look. If I shot that, it would have looked like I fucked up the color temperature on the camera like that. But somehow he's able to like really meld that in. But uh, again, jumping around everywhere. Uh, was it your website? You you helped shoot the Miss Cleo documentary. I did. That's that fun. rad. Well, <laughs> I remember that one well, so, so vividly. Call me now. Oh, <laughs> yeah. That was, that was a fun one. We um um we shot um interviews in la and then we shot more interviews in atlanta and it was just a wild ride just also i think being in atlanta and meeting a few people that were really close to her and they had a shrine of miss cleo wow. it was a lot like you're doing b-roll around the south and yeah it, it it was a lot, and to just see people get so emotional about the subject, you're just like, I am in a space I didn't know I was walking in through. Yeah, and that's I feel like sometimes with documentaries, things can change very quickly. Like they can go from being super happy to super sad, mm. and like all in a moment, and. It's not like a full 12 hour day. It's like six hours, but you've been getting information. You've been getting so much information in those hours where you're like, I'm so tired. Yeah. Um, yeah. The kids, <laughs> the kids was, don't know about calling one, eight, one, nine hundred numbers. <laughs> oh, no. no, they don't. <laughs> um, no, was, that, was, that was an important one. But I, I do like docs. I think docs are a good way to just like, I get to learn about a subject that I was not thinking about whatsoever. Yeah. And the script, well, it's not written, but it writes itself is a little easier, I guess. You know, you just go with it and then f- the editor figures it out. All I got to do. I, <laughs> I'm always, I'm always impressed. Like every time I see them edit of like a doc I've worked on, I'm like, congratulations. 
Like yeah. you, you pulled like very specific clips and you really made it into a story. Because yeah. I had no idea what we were shooting at. Well, yeah. like, I feel like when I shoot narrative, like I have a really good idea of where we're going from A to B. Whereas on documentaries, it always takes a turn. I'm like, I don't know where we're going. Right. Just got to be there. What, what's the street photography in F8 and be there? Yeah. Yeah. Um, You're sure. I know I've kept you over, so I'll just do the final jump over, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> which was uh, when we were talking earlier about um, uh, Inner Demon, and then I was going to compare it. So we were talking about shooting in a, in a room. How do you make a bowling alley look good? Do you lean into the overhead fluorescent lighting or do you just relight the whole thing or what was kind of was it produced was it production designed at all or did you what was that like so okay so all of our bowling scenes are all in one bowling alley so maggie the pd and i worked for a long time figuring out each look for each bowling alley and so Walt. As just kind of going. So it was just, it was one alley playing multiple alleys. Yes. So we had to kind of keep redressing the bowling alley. So sometimes it was like very practical resets. Uh, a couple times we did some like green screen walls mm. and they did like graphics and so forth. But pretty much the just give you like a recap of the story, just to give you a sense of sure. the chaos of the movie. <laughs> um, so Walt. He's like down on his luck. He's like this hood black dude. He starts working at a bowling alley and the bowling alley, it's going under. And we find out he's just really good at bowling. Like he throws, like it's, it's hilarious. Like how he throws the ball and he decides to go on tour with the kind of the local drum of the bowling alley. And she was also like a former pro bowler. So they go on tour. Is that Susan? As, uh, no. Oh. I don't know. She's about to come in. Oh, That's okay. sorry. My bad. My bad. There are, so Wall is played by Shamik Moore, Spider-Verse. And then his partner in crime is Darcy Carden. You might have seen her on um, A League of Their Own. Or like oh. Barry. She's, she's super funny. And... He, Walt ends up being just like amazing on bowling and he's turning bowling black and it's hilarious. Like he's just this fun dude taking over the bowling world and Susan Sarandon's character, she finds out and she's not having it. And she was this epic bowler from the nineties, like just a pristine bowler. And so she comes out of retirement to challenge him. And that's, that's kind of the movie. Got it. So it's like. It's, it's, it's ridiculous on all fronts, but they do go on this road trip of going to different bowling alleys, you know, doing this long tournament. So we had to kind of figure out, all right, what does Florida look like? What does Texas look like? And yeah, no, it was, it was, it was a ton of fun, but there was so many moments where like half the lanes, like lanes, like one or 10 are like one city. Okay, I can't shoot over there. And then lanes like 15 to 25 are a different city. Mm -hmm. And we had kind of a like cheating wall that we would use so we wouldn't shoot on the other set. Um, and then as for lighting, as wall gets to bigger and better bowling alleys, the lighting gets better. Mm. So in the original bowling alley that he works at and like his first tournament games, the lighting really leans into the mixed color overhead lighting. So it's like we use the shitty lighting that the bowling alley actually had. It was that like this bowling alley kind of needs to die. Right. Yeah, I think mean, it's a little still alive, but we use like that lighting. And then we had a lot of ground units and we just kind of keyed from the ground. But it was just kind of that nice color kind of feel. But as we, uh, I'm sorry about that. No, you're good. You're good. As as he goes the bigger bowling alleys, the lighting becomes a little cooler. We turn more once we get to the championship, it becomes like a full like overhead softbox. Um, so it was it was a lot of fun working with uh, my gaffer Marlon and my keeper Sean. 
and figuring out how to deviate these bowling alleys. And then we also got rid of all the oil that's on the lanes. Sure. Because right. you don't want people to die. <laughs> yeah. No, it's like you, you, you literally just like can't walk on the lanes. But without the oil, everyone's battle bowling. Like right. everyone. Yeah. So, um, so did you have to re oil the thing to get no, shots of the balls? No, we just kind of like we would swing it and, you know, like we did our magic to make it, to make it be a strike, to right. say the least. Right. But funny story one day the actual bowling alley decided to put the oil back on the lane. It was horrible. It was like, awesome. you're just seeing an entire crew trying to tiptoe around like these like two lanes that are oiled. Um, so it was total chaos. But I think what you would love is like shooting lines. Like we never, we only could have a crane for our final championship sequence. So for all the other bowling scenes, like we use steel deck um, and we put steel deck on the lanes. And we allowed, so you could bowl underneath the camera. So gotcha. we would put track on the steel deck and then we would kind of push in and pull out as they're bowling while the actor can literally bowl underneath the steel deck. Mm. That sounds like a really fun exercise using one space to like, and, and just like make the lighting better and better and better. Like that's almost like a film school in and of itself. Like here's a, here's a location. You have to make it look shitty and then look amazing in five iterations or whatever it's it's funny because early on and pre-pro we thought we were getting more locations and we didn't um so we just we were figuring out like okay this is how we would make it better or this was worse lighting but we found like a groove of like what is the optimal way of kind of lighting 360 mm. but still having little shape Cool. Well, I totally forgot. I have to. I do have to go. I forgot. I was literally about yeah. to say. Uh, I, like, I, I like, watched her and I was like, "Oh my god!" No, I was literally about to say like, uh, "You got to go" because I've kept you way too long. Uh, yeah. But thanks so much for uh, chatting with me. Uh, and and yeah, look we'll forward to seeing it when I can. <laughs> yes. Now I. Hopefully, it's it's out soon. It's very much like how the Knights meets Dodgeball. Incredible. Uh, it's what it, it's what the people need. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, thanks again. And like I said, uh, stay in touch, and we'll we'll hit uh, we'll hit the arts district, go to Death and Co, and uh, I'll show you all that. I love that. All right, I'll talk to you later. All right, later. Bye. Freeman Reference is an Owlbot production. It's produced and edited by me, Kenny McMillan, and distributed by Pro Video Coalition. If you'd like to support the podcast directly, you can go to frameandrefpod.com and click the button to buy me a coffee. It's always appreciated. As always, thanks for listening. And as a little editor's note, I have not interviewed Amy Vincent. I interviewed Amy Bench, who's also rad, but I'd love to talk to Amy Vincent, but I didn't. I think for some reason I had St. Vincent, the musician, on my mind. I don't know. I think that's the only editor's note I've ever put in a podcast. <laughs> anyway, thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. Bye.